Let's uh, call to order the regular business meeting of the Board of Education for Monday, June 26th to order. Uh, if I could ask everybody to please stand and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Board of Education for Monday, June 26th. Thank you for your time. I would like to ask the Here. Rudy. Here. Huber. Here. Sunset. Here. Thurman. Here. Mauer. Is that it? No. Luce. Yeah, we yeah, we'll get some more. Luce is here. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed you. I'm sorry. I thought that went by a little quickly. I'm so sorry. Got Kevin, right? Got Kevin? Oh, yeah. yeah. And then we got Okay, all right. So we sorry. know what Ellen Mauer is absent for the record. Uh, okay, our agenda. Um, we have uh, we will have a brief moment of silence here in a second. We'll open it up for public comment. Um, please limit your comments to three minutes. Um, President's report. We have some recognition tonight. Uh, then we'll have the superintendent's report, which covers a number of topics. Um, the consent vote agenda will approve. We just reviewed that within the last 30 minutes. So some detail. Uh, brief updates from program and personnel. Uh, and facilities and finance. Um, are you going to update on property? We're not going to actually update anything on property. No. Not. No. Seal. Unless you want. And I S region. No. no, no. Okay. And then we will have an executive session tonight. Um, two topics: employment of an employee, five ILCS one twenty slash two C one, and then probable litigation, five ILCS one twenty slash two C eleven. Um, we will not be taking action after that. Um, that stars there just in case. Um, but we will not be taking any action. Um, and then we will adjourn. All right. So before I begin, I need to appoint a secretary pro tem. That will be member Lundstedt. Okay. Any other questions? All right. So um, do you want to? Uh, yeah, please. Um, for our community, last month our dear friend and colleague Deb Larson lost her brave battle with cancer. Deb de dedicated the majority of her career to District 128. She began teaching math at LHS in 1982 and eventually became the math department supervisor. She moved to the district office personnel department in 1999 and later became an assistant principal at the newly opened Vernon Hills High School. Finally, Deb returned to district office as assistant superintendent for curriculum and instruction, the position she held until she retired. Deb made a great impact on her students and colleagues, and she will be greatly missed by all who knew her. Please join me in a moment of silence for Deb. Thank you. Anyone from the public who would like to speak? Stuart, do we need one? Can you pick everybody up? I can up? pick everybody up. Right. Kim Anderson, 821 Bartlett Terrace, Libertyville. Just two things to cover. First one is, I was informed earlier at the committee meetings that when you vote on page uh, two, the approval of the regular board meeting, you'll have on the board meeting minutes that I would get a written response as I was guaranteed at the last board meeting on the two question is who is the compliance officer and what are the policies and recourse if the public suggested there's violations of board policy. I've been informed orally but not in writing and I still request, I believe I'm owed it in writing because it says in the minutes of the board meeting I would get it in writing but I've been informed for the record there is no compliance officer, and there is absolutely no policy for recourse or reviewing violations of policy. So I think that needs to be recorded for the record. There is no recourse for board policies. So therefore, policies are written, but they have no merit, because there can be no challenge to the policy or recourse to the policy. There is no format. To that end, I've been continuously bringing to the board's attention what I thought was a violation of section 2, colon 105. 
because the board would not deal with it the same way District 70 does by forming an ethics commission, I had to go to the state's attorney's office. At the last board meeting, Pat, you read a letter from Lisa Madigan's office because a member from the public at the meeting before that made comments as to what they thought was a violation of policy and law. And Lisa Madigan looked into it and responded. And you read that response to the public. I didn't think it was necessary, but you felt it was necessary. And I asked at that meeting, if in fact a law enforcement agency makes a decision either way, will you read it? I did not hear a response that you're going to read the indictments that came down last week. But I think most people know that one board member and a superintendent secretary were indicted for perjury. And Pat, I just want to take my time because you, and I'll read just part of Denise's indictment. It goes on, this grand jury chosen, elected, sworn in by the county, etc., etc. On December 1st, Denise went perjury, but the line to focus on is, under oath, the Nuri Republic signed a petition, not only a petition for Patrick Grudy, nonpartisan candidate for the District 128 School Board. Sheets four, five, and six. So Pat, you are referenced in this indictment. My interpretation is, therefore, you are a um, non-indicted co-conspirator of the problem. It is a horrible thing, and I feel, and I am very sincere about this. Denise had to, and Ellen did, had to have mugshots put in the paper. That is distressfully and humiliating. Collateral damages are their families and friends. It shouldn't have happened. Now the question is, it wouldn't have happened if Tim hadn't made an issue of it. No, it wouldn't have happened if the board had dealt with the matter. So Denise's problem is on Pat's and Prentice's. She is an employee. She directly reports to Prentice. She's not had her day in court yet to say why she did it. But she was indicted for circulating petitions and perjuring herself that she did it, as Ellen Maurer was indicted for that. These are serious charges. The board should address it. I don't know. Maybe we're gonna hear later under the press report. When a board member is indicted for felony criminal acts, do they have to be suspended or resigned from the board until they are vindicated. Yes, you're innocent until proven guilty, but this board has things they have to get about. And is it proper for someone under indictment to still sit at the board and vote? I don't know. Apparently there's no policy on that one. So the board has to address that. But if a board member is indicted, can they stay on the board? It takes four members of the board to vote for a replacement. That's your decision. The public is gonna to watch to see how you handle the matter. There are other things I've brought up before in regards to bid rigging and bid stringing. I am comfortable the state's attorney is now gonna deal with those too, as other things. If you enforced your board policy, reviewed your board policies, I wouldn't have to go to the state's attorney and they wouldn't then have to ask the grand jury for indictments. So it is about time that the board gets together, deals with these ethics problems or else there's just going to have to be more indictments until you do. I think I've used less than three minutes. Anyone else? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Anna Dre, 1020, actually. Um, things need to be done properly, but I do think it's appropriate for some of these to be on the board until they're convicted because we are all in essential proven guilty. Um, that's just not two cents for it. Um, I wanted to address you guys tonight about two things. One, I needed to be a clone tonight. I needed to be here because it's an important meeting. I also needed to be over at the Planning Commission where they're addressing District 128 business. We beg you guys time and time and time again to try and solve these conflicts. Um, at a minimum, I am going to be writing the Planning Commission and asking them that when they're doing actual District 128 business, to please not schedule it on District 128 board meeting night. Because I should think you guys want to be up there weighing in on that $21 million construction also. Um, the main thing I wanted to address all that was 
here's a shop parking at the high school next year. Um, so um, we had a meeting. You guys heard what everybody had to say. Two days later, we heard that y'all are looking at possibly closing the back gate to anybody who's not a, uh, a, a permitted parker at the high school. So one of the students, one of the lucky students who won the lottery or somebody who works at the school. Um, I, I'm going to implore you guys not to do that. Um, one, that gate has taken a tremendous amount of relief off of the traffic on 176, just under normal circumstances. Your situation on the campus, while you're going to have construction traffic going on, it's actually going to be a little relieved by the fact you have less students driving onto the campus next year. Um, so you'll, you will have more people driving their kids because of that. Um, so you've got the kids who were fortunate enough to get the passes and the families who weren't fortunate enough to get the passes. We can't even pull onto the campus from that way to drop our children off to their state mandated education. You're going to have construction going on on Butterfield. You guys are doing construction and who knows what's going to happen on the Archdiocese property during the same time frame. Throwing all of that traffic out onto 176 is going to further congest a road that we all try to avoid. Anybody knows the traffic pattern here in Libertyville. And what's effectively going to happen, I'm going to pull my son up to the back, tell him to stop, drop, and roll, get the heck out, and walk the rest of the way, and I'm not going to go out on the 176. I think it's creating a problem. I appreciate you guys are trying to address a problem, but I think your solution is actually worse than what you're trying to address. Thank you. Anyone else? Wherever Lane. Lane Hassler. Um, first, before I have some comments I'd like to make, but in the committee meeting, I heard Superintendent Lee talk about detachments. And if you will indulge me, as a member of District 68's board, I've gone through the detachment process. I wanted to share with this board a couple of, of my experiences, and I don't want that to count against my three minutes. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, first, Judge Winter, who was mentioned, same judge as on Lancaster. She got it wrong then. The law has changed. Sounds like she might get it right this time. So just so you know, same judge. The impact on District 68 from the Lancaster detachment was significant. We brought in about 32 kids. The tax revenue that we got was about half of what we spent to educate those 32 kids. So the hit to 68 was about 180 grand a year from that detachment. That's one of the reasons why we fought the detachment so hard and we'll continue to fight them. Second, we don't have the room at 68. I don't know what 128's capacity is. We're bumping up against capacity. We're looking at, if we have more detachments, trailers in the parking lot. Nobody wants that. But finally, from our board perspective, it's a fundamental fairness. You pay a premium to live in Libertyville. Uh, when I moved here, I looked at some houses in Daybreak and asked my wife, why are we looking where we live when we can get something much cheaper there? My brother-in-law who lived here said, it's the schools. So it's a fundamental fairness issue. You know where your kids are going to school when you buy the house. You shouldn't be able to squeeze your way in and not pay the premium. So I just wanted to share with you the perspective that I've had. Um, and I, I've also appreciated the way the districts have worked together. And it's not just 68 working with 128. It's working with Warren and with Woodland because they have a vested interest too. It hurts them as much as it hurts us. So I just wanted to share with you that perspective. Um, as you know from the email that I sent to the board last month, I was unable to attend the main meeting in order to present my counterpart to the official board position on the hiring process uh, involving the two administrative positions. I have three things that I'd like to share with the board this evening. First, while the Attorney General's office found there was not a technical violation of the Open Meetings Act, that's not a dispositive decision. Any citizen may file a lawsuit asking the courts to decide whether there's a violation of the statute. I didn't do that. But going forward, I'm going to continue to review the agendas. And the next time that the board votes on an item that's not on the agenda for a vote, I may in fact bring such a suit to determine, have the courts determine whether that's proper procedure. And I believe you might be giving me that opportunity tonight because I see on the agenda that the superintendent is going to recommend the appointment of some FOIA officers. I don't see that on for a vote. If you vote on it and it's not listed for a vote, you've given me my next opportunity to file a complaint. Okay, so All you have to do to solve this problem. Go ahead, finish. 
I don't see it on there. Yeah. Uh, all you have to do to solve this problem is just clearly put what you're voting on under action items. That's all I'm asking you to do. Don't rely on the fact that it might technically be proper for the superintendent to include it in his comments and then vote on it. All right, so then can I clarify just Yeah. All right. So there's a star next to agenda item number 11. Yeah. Okay. And there is a footnote to the star that says, there's a star here that says board action will be taken. So okay, I didn't see, when I looked online... And by the way, that has been on the agenda. First of all, that star has always been there, and those of us on the board understood that to be the case. Yeah. But to further clarify that, in response to your public comments a few months ago, that change was immediately made to clarify that. When I pulled up the board agenda on my iPad and flipped through all of the various things, the agenda was there, and then tonight when I saw the pink copy, I saw for the first time the attachments. So that's a great step in the right direction. Usually you have to scroll down a little bit. It's, just, a little it's confusing. at the you have bottom to keep, of the agenda. Yeah. It's not in the it, well, let me still check. Maybe one more step just to throw on the bottom. All right, again, this is not, what we're voting on. It's not in the attachments. Yeah. It's at the very bottom after the last agenda. After 10. When? After 10. Okay. After number 10. So you have to we, dig so over to your point. We can move yeah. it to the top yeah. of the agenda if that makes it clearer for people. I got no issue with that. Can effective immediately. Can we move that to the top of the agenda? Okay, that's fine. That put would solve the problem. We need sure. to put it in colors. I mean, whatever we got to do. And my point here tonight is I just wanted to put a bow on some things just to sort of wrap up. And I appreciate you entertaining that and doing that. The second item that I wanted to talk about was the actual hiring process itself. Um, there was a lot of description that the board of administration went through a very thorough search. I filed a FOIA request, a Freedom of Information Act request. I got 11 pages in response. That's all. So the entire hiring process generated 11 pages of documents. And one question I specifically asked was, all documents the board relied on in reviewing candidates and making their decision? The answer I got was, no documents. So I find it beyond belief that a proper hiring process would generate no documents. Lastly, District 128 has a written policy regarding bullying to protect students. And it says in part, bullying is communications made in writing or electronically that have the effect of substantially interfering with the student's ability to participate in or benefit from the services, activities, or privileges provided by the school. This same policy against bullying should apply to the general public's participation in public comment. After my public comment at the April meeting, District 128 took an unprecedented step of posting its position on the Facebook page for 128. And then they went further and sent an email to the entire district with that position. Well, I was able to respond to the Facebook post, but since I don't have the email addresses for all of the members in the district, including parents who are my peers, I couldn't respond to that. I feel like that step was bullying. And you don't want to do that to your public because public comment provides valuable input. You may not agree with what you hear, but it's a perspective you may not have thought of. In my six years on the District 68 board, there have been a lot of issues that I never thought of and I disagreed with. And I'm on the losing end of a lot of 6-1 votes. But at least I had the opportunity to hear it, investigate it, and be aware of it before I voted. There's a change in the way things are being done in 128. I think you can appreciate that. The public's getting active, and they're demanding that the board and the administration follow the rules. And in particular, they're demanding that the board do its own investigation into issues and represents an independent voice separate from the administration. Thank you for the time. Thanks, Anyone else? Uh, Bill Bennett, 1109 West Golf Road, and Libertyville. In Wildcat Class 86, um, I, I had two things. Uh, one, um, <clears throat> appreciate the work on the parking and uh, running down, running out those ground walls. I like that phrase. I'm going to use that again. Um, <clears throat> uh, but I didn't hear anything about. I had suggested last time, perhaps maybe looking at uh, St. John's Lutheran or the, uh, the the church down on Garfield and Austin, which appear to be closer than uh, was that the free. Church that's got a big parking lot and rarely uh, has uh, people in it. And so I just thought that would be another great possible step that's pro proximate and uh, safe uh, travel to the uh, to the school. 
Can I, uh, Bill, I, I'm sorry I didn't mention that, and mention that committee on the string of things that we ran down, but um, from our, our working group at that meeting, someone is contacting the churches to see if that's even a possibility. Yeah. You know, with, with, if they're running preschools and whatever, if they'll give us some slides. So we are looking at that possibility. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank so thank you, though, for because okay. I forgot to mention that. I forgot to include one comment. I always focused on the process, and I meant that I focused on the process, and I wish our two new administrators the best of luck and the most success at District 128. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Wayne. All right, anybody else? Okay. All right, so um, under the President's report tonight is a very special night, uh, a milestone of sorts. For some people. Yeah. <laughs> We have very, three very distinguished people who have been with us for a number of years. Um, and I, suffice it to say, I think um, in all three cases, um, successfully achieving countless contributions to this district. Um, those three people being Dr. Al Fleming, uh, Mrs. Yasmin Dada, and Dr. Marina Scott, all of whom will be retiring at the end of this month. I can remember when you all said you were retiring, and it just seemed like four years ago was a long time out there. And it's hard to believe that this day has finally arrived. So um, on behalf of everybody, um, and I don't know if you have any additional comments yeah. on it, but I just want to say thank you for all of your many years of service, your extreme hard work, um, your patience. Um, I don't know how more, much more independent I can be when it comes to your reports, but. We'll try. Um, but uh, it's been a pleasure to work with all of you. Um, I think you are what exemplifies this district and the kind of people that we have and your commitment to the students and, you know, really changing lives. Um, so I hope for you it's been extremely rewarding. Um, I know it's been very rewarding to work with you. And uh, again, I just want to say thanks for all of your help and service, and I wish you the very best in your new endeavors which I hope you can enjoy thoroughly. And I would add, yeah. So. And, and I would add this over the last, last six or seven months, we've kind of been going through pieces of D128, Renaissance, Good to Great, uh, some of the dramatic uh, increases in student achievement that we've had, uh, and as a result, some of the external rec uh, recognition that the district has. Uh, receive and I can tell all of you as you all know in your own world that we're only as good as our people around us uh, There is no superintendent or building principal uh, That's smart enough to have all the answers in this very complex world that we live in uh, today in, in public education, so uh, to have um, a compelling really gifted set of leaders in the district is really um, critical uh, to our success at the end of the day to help us make it happen uh, and lead those efforts. And um, Yasmin is the most senior of the administrators uh, in the district. Yas, you were hired by Don, right? So uh, Yas goes back to the latter part of Don Gossett's um, tenure, long tenure as superintendent and administrator in the district, and then worked for about 10 years for Dave and has worked with me for the last uh, nine years in, in her role. And then uh, Marina came in uh, first as uh, associate superintendent and um, then Brad left and went to uh, Libertyville or uh, Highland Park and we did an interim for two years because we would not settle. We were waiting for a marina kind of principal um, and uh, Marina had an interest in, in leading that great school and has done a phenomenal uh, job during her time here. Uh, and then of course Al came uh, as associate superintendent who is really in our world the chief operating officer. Uh, really kind of leads the district and keeps things going on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, you know, is uh, highly, highly regarded by the leadership team, the staff in the district for his very um, even demeanor uh, in dealing with sometimes very uh, challenging issues and he's certainly been a great uh, right and left hand for me um, as the superintendent to allow me what I need to do as a superintendent and still keep the district moving forward. So. Um, we've already had an opportunity to kind of interact with Marina and, and Yaz and Al several times uh, now at the end of the run, at the end of the kind of chicken chicken and uh, fried chicken circuit at the end of the day uh, with the banquets at the end of the year. 
uh, and gatherings, but I, I want to say to you again how much that you have uh, meant to me professionally and personally uh, in terms of the high quality work that you've done to serve the, the students and the parents of the district. So on behalf of the administration, teachers and support staff, uh, thank you for your phenomenal work. And I think Pat has something to give you. Yeah, so for each of you, we have a certificate. It's a certificate of appreciation upon retirement. The District 128 Board of Education and Administration recognized each of you um, for your distinguished service to our students, staff, and fam families given on this day, the 26th of June, uh, 2007. Can we have you guys come this way with us? Again, Come up. Or you want to stay here, Mary, or come up there? You can move. Okay, let's just go to the Thank you for all your help. Thank you for all your One for you. And with you, there was a tremendous sense of humor. <laughs> Still getting over the, the horse. We're going to miss those stories. <laughs> and all you. of your hard work. We will Thank definitely you. miss you. I'm sure Dan will be calling. <laughs> all right, let's squeeze in a little bit. Thanks again. Thanks. And while we're um, sitting down again, I do want to let you know that both Yasmin and uh, Al have done uh, phenomenal work with Bryant and Dan uh, in the transition and will continue to be available for them um, to assist as they need in transition. So thank you for that because that crossover is really important too for us. Okay. Okay. Um, superintendent's report. Okay, we start with some good news uh, tonight. Even though it's summer, we have students that are uh, very active. 2017, T128 graduates Ryan Bogan and Anika McDermott Hinman from LHS and Ashwini Deshpandi from VHHS were named to the Daily Herald Lake County Academic Team for 2016-17. VHS senior Oliver uh, Wang was named honorable mention. Seven D128 students were recently selected for the 2018 Illinois High School Theater Festival All-State Production of Big Fish. From VHHS, Samantha Colber in the orchestra pit, Skylar Torrey, technical crew in costumes, Valerie Smith, technical crew construction crew, Sophia Schmelzer, uh, technical crew construction crew, Mackenzie Furlett, ensemble, and Donna Lee uh, Black, ensemble. From LHS, Claire Reese Austin for ensemble. The festival will be held January 11th through 13th at Illinois State University in Normal. District 128 Special Olympians were among the 4,200 record number athletes who competed in six sports at the 2017 Special Olympics. Illinois Summer Games held June 9th to 11th in Bloomington Normal. D12 athletes received the following honors. Austin Yosenhans uh, in bocce ball was gold in singles and silver in doubles. Nathan Ferrara in bocce was silver in doubles. Mallory Marvin in track was seventh place in the 50 meter. <coughs> Eric Hatterlin in track was bronze in the 200 meter. Anna Scholler in uh, bocce was silver in doubles. Hope Michelotti, uh was um, in bocce was silver in doubles. And Vinnie Roberts uh, was also uh, silver in singles in bocce ball. And you might get the impression uh, that we have a long history of excellence in bocce ball with our Special Olympians. And uh, former Superintendent Dave Clough and I once went over and took them on for a challenge and we were destroyed. So uh, they're really good. In addition to the state games, members of the family of former District 128 Special Olympics coach Jim Rogers were on hand June 8th for the unveiling of a memorial brick honoring Coach Rogers at the Special Olympics Illinois Tribute Park in Normal. The park, dedicated in 2000, June 2015, is a lasting tribute to the enduring spirit of athletes, <coughs> families, volunteers, and donors. Coach Rogers, who passed away in 2015, was one of the first coaches to join head coach Andy Compton in the early years of the District 128 Special Olympics program. The memorial brick was funded through generous donations by present and former D128 Special Olympics parents, coaches, and team members. And LHS junior Miriam Tolba recently received the National Center for Women in Information Technology Northern Illinois Affiliate Award for honorable merit from NCWIT 
Um, the award recognizes a recipient for strength of their computing aspirations and accomplishments, as well as their leadership ability, academic history, and plans for post-secondary education. Miriam received the award along with her teacher, Teresa Elmer, in an award ceremony on May 6th at U uh, Lewis University in Romeoville. So congratulations to um, all of our District 128 students and they will be active throughout the summer and we'll have good news to report on. Uh, next on uh, my report as we uh, updated the Program and Personnel Committee uh, earlier this evening, uh, we want to let the public, particularly uh, the Libertyville public, know that we have resolved the graduation date issue uh, for next year at Libertyville High School. Graduation will be Thursday, May 24th uh, at the Sears Center. Um, um, quick overview, uh, just to review that again, um, when we changed our calendar uh, to um, have uh, final exams before the winter holiday, I'd altered our end of the year schedule. Our traditional date that uh, we have and is held for us at Sears Center um, was after uh, Memorial Day and uh, would be even later uh, next year, just did not work for us. So the only available date uh, and I think that was actually on the calendar was uh, May 18th. That created a myriad of problems with seniors. Um, <coughs> senior final exams, um, do we bring seniors back after? Um, you know, graduation for finals? No, of course we're not gonna do that. Um, do we give the seniors uh, finals in their classes, uh, which are mixed classes and during regular periods, that creates other instructional problems. Uh, at the end of the year, do we not have senior finals, which probably would have made some of the seniors happy. Uh, Unless they needed the grade. Yeah, <laughs> I'm guessing, yes. If they needed the grade, they could optionally do it. But uh, notwithstanding, that's a broader com educational conversation about final exams in general, um, and we have not arrived at that point yet. Um, so uh, we began looking at you know viable options. As you know, we have a very large graduation, you know, 42 to 4,800. Uh, people attend there, so we need a unique uh, facility. We've done this several times over the years. Um, but uh, before we actively pursued uh, a plan B option, um, Sandra Kruckman, Marina's administrative assistant, soon Tom's administrative assistant, uh, actually called back and uh, to double check with Sears Center, and lo and behold, Lake Park High School uh, down in the western suburbs needed to move their graduation from Thursday, May 24th to uh, May 31st, which opened up that date uh, for us. We were able to lock that date in, uh, and so both our uh, graduations will be on the 24th. That's very common for multi, those of us that work, have worked in multi-high school uh, districts will simply split the board up. Um, we'll split the central district administrative staff up um, at the two graduations. So uh, now that we have that date, we'll be locked in um, on that corresponding date um, every year moving forward at the Sears Center. Uh, again, great folks to work with out there. Um, done a lot of work. Um, the staff at LHS has done a lot of work to, uh, you know, make that renewable every year uh, at, at uh, a minimal uh, effort. And I did mention um, earlier um, that um, we will have a different version of the National Anthem at graduation uh, next year. Okay, so the heart was in the right place. Uh, for the national anthem this year, but probably I think we agree that um, probably the um, um, uh, the locale or the event might have not been the most appropriate um, uh, forum uh, for that particular national anthem. So uh, anyway, I think we are uh, in good shape with the graduation date. Uh, we're very excited to be able to kind of nail that down. And as Rita works with the calendar committee, part of the conversation that we've had is when we start to work on next year's calendar in the fall, we will actually try and work, look two years out uh, and then we will work back from when the seniors final exams and when the seniors have um, graduation. And uh, just as a last thank you to Marina, uh, great job with your commencements over the years and uh, always been first class and, and really great. So we're very thankful of that, okay? So, um, LHS student parking, okay, uh, we've spent a lot of time on that um, over the last month or so. Uh, we had a very productive meeting uh, with Mayor Terry Wepler, uh, Village Administrator uh, Chris Clark, and uh, Police Chief um, Clint Hurtigan. 
Um, and uh, with us was Assistant Principal for Operations, Eric Marosher, and Hassan uh, Rasek, who is the um, Police Re uh, Resource Officer at Libertyville High School. Uh, we investigated uh, a number of options that we talked about, um, and uh, tomorrow night at the streets committee meeting, um, um, several of our team members will be there uh, for a follow-up, but uh, among the options that we looked at uh, were the parking garage um, nearest uh, the high school. Uh, we also looked at parking in and around Butler Lake um, area and the park there, uh, absolutely. Um, we looked at uh, some of the op other options that were talked about, including you know laying some um, stone down on the, several, the couple lots that we do own across the street. Uh, there's some issues with IDOT there in terms of the width of the driveway that would be required in going through a long approval process with them and not knowing whether at the end of the day they would actually approve that. Um, on um, Route um, 176, um, we also looked at um, uh, Bill had mentioned earlier, we're also contacting the, um, the churches in the area. We also assessed the Motorola option, kids parking out at Motorola, getting on a shuttle bus coming um, back to school. So we ran all those ground balls out. And it seems at this point, and again, I don't want to obligate you know anybody in a conversation that's ongoing and needs to be processed a little bit more, but it seems like uh, uh, Butler Lake um, uh, Park in that area um, maybe our best option. Uh, students would be able to walk the path, we would maintain the path, uh, particularly in the winter in terms of plowing it. Um, depending on where they're parking up there, they may need to cross Lake Street, but they're not crossing Gar maybe Garfield in the morning or some of the other um, streets. And then, um, you know, also looked at the parking garage. So they'll be talking about some of those options um, tomorrow night. Again, uh, the village was, as they almost always are, um, was very willing to work with us on a kind of a two-year temporary solution um, moving forward. Um, so that's kind of where we stand. So we'll have more information after the meeting tomorrow night uh, with the streets committee and if the village board needs to vote on anything, I believe their re regular village board meeting follows that. So we would have an opportunity, opportunity to know uh, what that outcome would be. So again, good. Um, conversations over a number of months with village officials, including um, Chief Hurtigan and the police, our resource officer and personnel at Libertyville High School. So um, the one other thing I wanted to uh, report out on, because this question was asked at uh, committee meetings, we went back and did um, quite an assessment or, or at least consideration of the concept of at this, what we would say is a pretty late date, looking at um, the option of doing semester by semester main lot uh, parking. And uh, our conclusion is that, that would really create more confusion at this point. It's pretty deep into the summer. We're almost into July. People are out, gone. Um, and to try and make all that work. So our recommendation at the committee to the board was that we continue the process that we've established for this year and we continue a conversation about uh, semester by semester parking. Uh, in the main lot for um, the following year. So just to review, all seniors who um, won the Google Randomizer lottery for parking uh, will be able to park in the main lot next year. Any other seniors who uh, indicated an interest in driving, which included a couple of students who for various reasons may have missed you know, getting their name in on the announcements, uh, will be accommodated at the Brainerd lot next year with the sticker. So they're guaranteed um, a parking spot, um, you know, a block and a half or so um, away from campus will not have to compete with juniors uh, for that. Uh, there has been some conversation, again, with the village about the Diamond uh, lot um, and District 70 about the possibility of actually striping that lot. Uh, it's not really striped uh, right now, and then having the village monitor that, so the parking would be a little bit more uh, organized, and that's so random um, over there, um, um, you know, um, moving forward. So uh, that looks like the plan right now, and as um, Anna mentioned um, earlier, we've got a team of people, again, including the uh, police who are looking at traffic and particularly drop-off uh, patterns there. Um, we have and uh, are still 
uh, having some conversation and some consideration of the possibility of a later start at Libertyville next year, possibility of adopting um, you know, Vernon Hills' time schedule, which is 20 or 25 minutes later. Uh, the idea, if we were to pursue that, we would need to make that decision pretty soon. Um, and secondly, there's no tangible evidence because we can't do an apples and apples, apples to apples comparison to see if that would make a difference in the morning. But the working theory would be it would open a longer gap in the morning. The afternoon is not nearly as problematic uh, at LHS because a number of the seniors are, are gone uh, by eighth period. So that lot's a little more cleaned out if you've been there at the end of the day and the buses are able to um, to get out of um, you know to get out of there uh, reasonably. We think we could. Uh, accommodate uh, you know athletics uh, in the back of the year we still have some leg work to do with the bus company to see if you know they can do that although we're not sharing buses with the elementaries um, anymore but we want to make sure that we're not doing that just to do it so if we don't think between us and the police department uh, in troubleshooting this that that would actually make a difference in the morning and there's no reason to change that schedule that's really consensus of the wisdom on that um, so if we were going to do uh, anything along um, uh, kind of that line, it would be right after, you know, the 4th of July holidays. So we could, you know, let our own staff know, uh, let parents know. But again, we don't see a, we don't see a definitive yield there yet. Uh, but I didn't mention that in uh, committee earlier, and I wanted to make sure that I mentioned it uh, tonight. So uh, that's where we're at on student parking, and by tomorrow evening, uh, or at the latest Wednesday morning, hopefully we should have some direction. Uh, but I do want to comment, uh, compliment the village again, Terry and village administrator, police chief uh, Dusan for uh, their work with us on this. Again, very accommodating, very willing to work with us to try and resolve the problem. Okay, any other questions? Okay, uh, next on my agenda are LHS athletic director uh, position. Again, uh, we did this update in uh, committee earlier. Uh, after um, an extensive search for the athletic uh, director position, we had lots of interest, uh, and there were four candidates uh, who really rose to the top. Any of the four of which would have, um, I think, Tom felt, would Tom Calentes felt, uh, and the team at Libertyville felt, uh, would have done uh, really uh, good work uh, as really great work as an athletic director. For a variety of really different reasons, uh, none of the four uh, were either able to um, accept the position or take the position. Um, so that left Tom and the team in a situation to kind of review the rest of the candidates. And again, there was, uh, I think, in our view, a substantive drop off between the top four and the other candidates. As we've said before, we will not settle uh, in this district. Um, we have several exa examples over the last 10 or 12 years. Uh, where we went to interims rather than just taking someone to fill a position. Uh, we'll wait to get the next, um, you know, really top shelf athletic director, um, you know, in a process for next year. So we began to look at, Tom began to look at and suggest um, interim uh, athletic directors for uh, next year. So we informed the board um, at the committee meeting that John Fischel, uh, who's a longtime um, teacher, coach, um, uh, particularly in the swimming program. I uh, was assistant athletic director for several years at Libertyville High School. Uh, is well known in the community, great organizational skills, very good people skills. Uh, and he currently um, on contract takes care of our uh, building uh, rentals in the district, which is a huge um, undertaking. Um, will be one of the interims. Uh, the other interim will be Aunt, Aunt, or Randy Overremt. And Andy is a recently retired athletic director at New Trier High School. Uh, again, very highly regarded uh, by his peers and the folks at New Trier. Um, Randy also has um, a collegiate background. He was um, actually at the collegiate level as a teacher, professor, and coach uh, for a number of years before he moved to uh, New Trier to take on uh, that position. The way Tom and the team have structured those two positions at each sport We'll have an assigned athletic director. So if you are a boys soccer parent, you know that athletic director X is your athletic director. So it's not uh, going to be dependent on who's in that day um, in, in terms of handling you know, all of the things that would go uh, with that particular sport. Uh, they did a great job of kind of articulating that plan and putting that plan together. 
Um, and Al and I both believe it's a, it's a really strong program and we've got two really good people uh, to do that job. So sometimes toward mid-year uh, next year, which is um, really kind of the normal time you would begin that kind of work, uh, then Tom will work with Brian, who will be an Al's position then, uh, to post that position, and then uh, we'll go through the, the process again. So um, that position will be hired as part of the committee <coughs> agenda this evening because we had a conversation about that at the um, personnel committee uh, earlier. And then, of course, if the board votes on that, then we'll be getting that information out to parents. Tom will be getting that information out uh, to uh, parents and students and staff tomorrow. Um, morning sometime okay any other questions on that since we did it the first time okay next uh, uh, Wayne Mr. Hassler had uh, mentioned detachments before um, and uh, not to add too much more to that but we uh, let, went into a little bit more depth uh, in committee meetings some of the citizens may not be aware that we are often contacted by subdivisions who uh, are on the periphery outside our borders who wish to detach from their current subdivision in school districts and come into our district. Um, at the end of the day, the, um, what's often problematic with that is that um, we cannot control the growth, or we cannot control the footprint of our district. So uh, taxpayers have given us resources based on projected enrollment. We built two really wonderful facilities here uh, to serve our kids um, moving forward and um, if we have um, a number of detachments over a period of time, uh, not only do we get those additional kids in the district for us now, particularly at a time where there's been some proposed development in Libertyville, there has been proposed development in Vernon Hills, um, which could impact our student enrollment, i.e. our facilities at some point um, down the line. And that is even more an issue, as Mr. Hassler has pointed out, for the elementary um, districts at the high school, we have a little better ability to absorb students because those students are spread across eight periods. Um, in an elementary school, if they have 25 new third graders show up, they have to have a dedicated classroom and they have to have a dedicated teacher for those third graders. So it's more problematic. So we've worked through several of these over the last three or four years. We have two active ones right now that uh, Lynn Himes, um, Scariano, uh, Sperm, uh, is working with the districts and joint council for us uh, moving forward um, that we're waiting for a, a ruling on a judge where we hear that under an old set of rules or a new set of laws that actually we helped um, you know create um, in the system so uh, we simply bring that to the board once a year so we kind of review the status we go through that again we see if the board has any additional questions I will let the public know in the last four months I have been personally contacted by Arbor Vista subdivision, which is in the far northeast corner of the district, as well as Merritt Club, regarding their interest to detach from um, the, the current school districts that they would be affiliated with and come into District 128. And again, generally speaking, um, we work pretty closely with um, all the affected districts um, in that process. Um, you know, to ensure that all the districts, you know, continue to remain whole. So um, I don't think the board, I'll uh, speak for you tonight earlier in conversation, um, I don't think the board um, is uh, changing its position on that. But once a year, again, we just like to overview the, the big picture because often we're asked, why don't we take day breaks in or what day break farms are one of the groups, you know, there's good EAV there and, you know, it would not be many students. If, if, we acceded and we took um, Daybreak Farms in. Part of the issue is we have now ex expanded the footprint of our district. So the next subdivision next to Daybreak Farms now has the opportunity to legally engage in the detachment process. So you can do the math on that uh, as one district might be granted a detachment, then the next subdivision, the next subdivision, and we have no control over that uh, at a time where resources are challenging right now by by anybody's um, measure with the condition of the state so unless somebody has anything to add to that i think that um, is the issue okay uh lhs uh pool uh project yes do you want to do a you know a, an overview of kind of where mark is and where we're at in the process okay 
So uh, this evening we have a couple of representatives from District 128 at the village uh, meeting to review our plans for the upcoming pool at LHS. Late Friday evening, uh, we received some communication from the uh, uh, Development Review Committee on some of the changes that they would like for us to make to our project. Uh, right now, we are still assessing those requests to see what the impact will be on our uh, rather limited and tight budget uh, for the pool and whether or not those are things that we can or are willing to take on. Um, we will have a better idea of what the expectations are after the meeting today, and we hope to report to the board on that tomorrow. Among some of the uh, uh, some of the uh, unanticipated items that came from this review was adding more parking spaces at LHS, looking at uh, adding a detention facility for all three projects or all three phases of the project at the same time. Um, as well as uh, some additional information um, that meant that we could not get the approval that we were seeking tonight, but rather that would happen in July, which is obviously a concern for us as that would delay our own project. So um, hopefully um, between a few of us here, we can address that with the village and uh, um, bring the project back on time and in um, under budget. We'll have more information tomorrow, right? Um, any other questions on that? Um, so, uh, Brainerd Memorial Update, I think we can say we're on target right now. Um, we've gotten the necessary approvals from uh, the village. Yeah, as I understand it, we'll be doing some bidding on that. We are ready to go out um, to bid very soon. And, and then, um, you know, which we should be, the board should be uh, processing in July. And uh, we are, we think we're on target to be done before all of the LHS. 100th anniversary um, celebration um, in the fall. Illinois 100th legislature. <laughs> Where we're at right now is we're not, still. Um, we have uh, received over the last few days, we being superintendents have received over the last few days, uh, to the credit of our local legislators, many communications, uh, questions about how things might impact us, uh, those type of things and right now what we know for sure is there is no budget agreement unless that's happened while I'm speaking uh, at this point uh, the school um, uh, funding reform bill the evidence-based school funding form uh, formula uh, which was passed by the House and the Senate has not been signed uh, by the governor right now uh, working through some related Chicago public school issues uh, it's our best chance to change a really broken formula uh, in the state of Illinois without anyone losing what they currently get, but still distributing greater resources to the districts that need them um, across the state. So we'll just be monitoring that uh, closely. I did participate in a, a, a panel uh, last week down in Buffalo Grove at Ivy Hall Elementary School, which was sponsored by uh, Representative Carol Senti. Um, Representative Will Davis uh, was at the meeting. He is the chair of the House Education Appropriations Committee. Also a great guy, great legislature. Kevin's done uh, some work with him along the way. But uh, Will is also the sponsor of uh, HB 2008, which is the evidence-based um, school funding reform model that went through the House, essentially the same as Senate Bill 1 that went through um, the Senate. And Ralph Martiri uh, is from the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability. That's a nonpartisan. Um, kind of a research group. You may have seen Ralph on uh, Chicago Tonight. He's often a guest uh, there. He often testifies um, in Springfield um, on the school uh, funding formula. And we actually had a, a turnout of around 50 people who learned more, asked great questions uh, about the school funding formula and how might, it might impact their particular district. And so we'll just continue to, to monitor uh, as we're moving forward, and obviously if anything shakes out on either of those fronts, I'll let the board know, um, and we'll try and get the word out um, to the community. Um, nobody's guessed whether it's actually gonna get done. I will tell you today, we were asked early in the day, uh, what would the impact of a four-year property tax freeze be on your district? Um, challenging, okay. <laughs> challenging for our district, catastrophic for a number of other districts. 
Um, so it's a balancing act between the property tax freeze, as Pat pointed out in our Finance 101 um, um, presentations that we did throughout the district this year. It's a balancing act um, because if you go four years, you know, in a district like ours, yeah, as I'm going to guess, at 5.1 or 2 million for two years, we're probably going to be at 10 or 12 million for four years, and that's uh, revenue loss. And what we have to do is take that revenue from existing things in the district. So that's challenging for us. Imagine how difficult it is for the 75% of the school districts in the state that are hanging on by their fingernails without reserves. So there's a lot of conversation about that balance between a property tax freeze and, an in, and the income tax extension, levying more income tax, and trying to find that balance. And that's part of what they're working on. So I'm sure they're going to have a lot more conversations going through the, you know, the end of the month uh, when they need to get it done if it's going to get done. So, um, okay, and uh, just want to wrap the 128 Renaissance up uh, tonight, great to greater. And Bo, if you can just put up the student um, achievements, uh, maybe the first or second slide. I don't have a clicker, so. Um, again, we've been having a, I've been having a little conversation with you every month about um, what we're calling the District 128 Renaissance and, and, and really, you know, great to greater. And based in large concept on Jim Collins' work in the business world on good to greater um, moving forward. And there are a number of components, but the point is this continued growth that we've arc that we've had over the district over a number of years, and our frame of reference, many of us, is really for the last 12 years or so. Um, it hasn't happened by chance, okay? It has happened through a, you know, a focused mission, okay, a set of goals, a set of plans to get there, ways to measure our progress, and then looking at the continual growth of our students. And it's predicated by the great resources that our community um, provides us, the readiness of many of our learners who come into school, you know, ready to go to the next level, the work of our teachers, in growing students that may not come up uh, with all the tools during that period of time uh, moving forward. And so people are a huge part of that. We spent last month talking about the, pri the primacy that we put on, you know, kind of the recruiting, interviewing, hiring, professional development and retention process here. And we believe the emphasis on that process at all levels of the organization um, has allowed us to continue to grow and put the best people the best leaders um, with our staffs and the best teachers in front of our kids that we can possibly have. And we believe that we've demonstrated some pretty significant growth in student achievement. So I want to wrap up kind of where I finished, and that's very quickly highlighting our student achievement, a couple of our student achievement gains over the last uh, 12 years. So first, again, this is our ACT growth and achievement from 2005 to 2016. Um, you can see that the district overall went up 1.2. Remember, an ACT, anything 0.3 higher or lower, statistically uh, significant. Um, and you can look at uh, the growth at both of the schools. Secondly, Bo, if you want to go to the next one, on our AP growth, this is another phenomenal. Uh, I think, why don't you flip up a couple slides, Bo, I think. Um, nope, back one. Okay. So on our AP uh, growth and achievement, um, going back to Dave Clough's time here, where there's really been, you know, an organized um, strategy to open the door to more students to take uh, that rich and enriched uh, advanced placement national level uh, curriculum. 103% increase in students taking AP exams. 131% increase in the number of AP exams taken. 149% increase in the number of students earning scores of three, four, or five on the exams, and 173% increase in the number of students earning scores of four or five. So the picture there is it's not just about ACT and advanced placement. However, those are two nationally recognized, nationally normed measures that um, we can look at. So in order in a district like ours it has a number of high achievers in it okay to move the needle at the level of act and ap growth and achievement it's all about continuing to move students up that growth ladder so uh, students who may come in 
you know, performing relatively low, being able to move them up to low middle and then middle middle, et cetera. Um, somebody that uh, comes in uh, kind of in the middle uh, as a measure to be able to take those kids to high middle and then low high, et cetera. Because we can't move that needle statistically with the number of kids that we have bunched in the top already if we're not addressing all students. And so that's a primary focus for us. So we want to thank the staff for their work again. We want to thank the board for their support uh, and work with us on that. We want to thank the communities for the incredible support and resources you give us to do what we do uh, with your children. And we want you to know this is how we measure ourselves on these two measures and a number of other measures during uh, the school year. And the bottom line in our business is, are our students growing? and are they achieving at higher levels and can we measure that and that's the bottom line for us so that's a little bit of our journey from great to greater taking this two phenomenal high schools and really taking them to even you know maybe a, a more elite uh, level but it's predicated um, on the work of all of us collectively as a village if you will uh, to help our students be more successful and that's our mission going forward uh, as we continue so um, again thanks for your support um, last we have, um, next to last for me, uh, we have our Freedom of Information request this month. On 6-8-17, we received um, a request from Emma Sasek from the Daily Herald. Um, the requested employees hired to instruct driver's ed courses in each year from 2012 to 2017, including the employee's full name age, other classes taught, or other duties performed by this employee, salary, and compensation for driver's education instruction if it is not part of the employee's regular salary. Um, Al and uh, Al Fleming and Denise uh, Sweat followed up on this, and um, um, we uh, actually revised um, our request with uh, depth of information, so we will um, be respond. Oh. And on the back, um, Emma uh, Sasek from Daily Herald also had a revised request, um, which superseded the first request. Employees who instructed driver's ed courses in each year from 2012 to 17, including employers, employees full name, age, other classes taught, other duties performed by this employee, salary compensation for driver's education instruction, if it is not part of the salary's employee's regular salary. Again, Alan Denise responded to this. The deadline was 6:15-17. We responded on 6, 15, 17, and the t uh, approximate time spent between the two of them was um, 1.5 hours. And I will note we get these requests um, somewhat often from news agencies and often third-party agencies, particularly from news media, who may be gathering information from all schools for a larger story. Um, and so uh, we don't know if that's what this is, but I suspect that it probably is part of a larger data, data mining gathering uh, for a larger story. Uh, and then last for me tonight is appointment of uh, new FOIA officers. Um, as you may realize, Al um, and um, Yasmin and Denise are our FOIA officers. FOIA officers. They work collectively, so with uh, Al's retirement uh, and Yasmin's retirement, my recommendation is to appoint Brian Kelly and uh, Dan Stanley as our new FOIA officer. So I would look for a motion from the board and uh, a vote. So moved. Second. Discussion. Roll call. Batson. Aye. Rudy. Aye. Huber. Aye. Luce. Aye. Munster. Aye. Thurman. Aye. Motion carries. Okay, Pat, I have nothing under other, so that concludes the superintendent's report. All right, thank you. Number three, the consent vote agenda. We reviewed it earlier tonight. I'd ask for a motion to approve the consent vote agenda as listed. Please. I move to uh, approve the consent of vote yeah. agenda. Second. Is there any discussion? Roll call, please. Rudy. Aye. Huber. Aye. Luce. Aye. Lundstedt. Aye. Thurman. Aye. Batson. Aye. Okay, uh, motion carries. Uh, Program and Personnel Committee. Can I yes, uh, first item, uh, board policy, first reading policy 7100. There's no action there. No, just uh, for, the right. first reading. for the first reading. But so do we have to read it? No. Uh, no. If there aren't any questions, then we'll bring it back okay. for second reading. Yes. And then the second item, educational tour request, PHHS Orchestra Tour of Budapest, Vienna, and Prague, March 23rd, 
for April 1st, 2018. Yeah, that's right. so I'm looking for a motion to approve that. I'll move it as long as I get to go on the trip. <laughs> <laughs> I'll second, second it. <laughs> Any discussion about that other than wanting second. to go along? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so, roll call, please. Huber? Aye. Luce? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Thurman? Aye. Batson? Aye. Rudy? Aye. Okay. Uh, just to highlight, those kinds of trips are at no cost to the district. Right. Sure right. that they're a student, student paid, right? Every time you see one of those, you go, wow. wow. And then you read the details. Right. Uh, a lot of cost to the student and no cost to the district. And okay. no other, right? <coughs> okay, facilities and finance, uh, Chairperson Bass. Thank you, Dr. Curry. Um, we have a number of things here. Pre first up, prevailing wage resolution. This is a standard resolution we have to do every year to uh, ensure we're uh, we uh, take care of the prevailing wage requirement. Any, uh, no. any further comment? No, it's just to make sure that the district is in compliance with uh, the prevailing wage resolution. And just as a side note, we do occasionally receive FOIAs asking to make sure that we have adopted this resolution. Yes, could you just take a minute and explain prevailing, prevailing wage to the, the community members that may be watching sure. and what that is? Uh, the state of Illinois publishes uh, the minimum amount that should be pay, paid for various trades. Those are stated very clearly as to what the rate is in uh, the resolution that we adopt this evening. So that if the district was going to go out and award a bid, one of the requirements is that we clearly state that the individuals who will work on that project are paid the prevailing wage. And uh, for labor, it could be a masonry, it could be uh, plumbing, it could be anything that really has a prevailing wage number attached to it. The prevailing and wages are set by the state, correct? It is set by the state on an annual basis, um, and it is published a little sooner than it was this year, so that's why it was a little late in coming uh, to you. And because it's published every year, we have to vote on it every year to accept that new set of prevailing wage correct. figures. Yes. So. In a company that we hire, we assume or we require that their bid is paying. That is right, and what we request of them is uh, their um, uh, payroll sheets, basically showing that employee X was paid this dollar amount, so that we have proof of that too, should we ever have to report it to the Department of Labor. Okay. We have a motion, please. So I move that we. Uh, Paying prevailing or the prevailing wage resolution as just presented. Second. Any other comments, questions? No? Roll call, please. Luce? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Thurman? Aye. Batson? Aye. Rudy? Aye. Huber? Aye. Um, the next item on the agenda is the LHS pool project construction management contract. I assume we're going to table this because of some delay in resolving a couple final issues. That is correct, and I, since our uh, FNF committee meeting, I've received a couple of emails from our attorneys, so that process is ongoing right now. Okay, yeah. Okay, so, so we'll be worried we'll table. Yeah, yeah, so we have to table that because we don't have all the information. Uh, item C, approval of the FY 2018 budget calendar. And uh, there's a couple of key items coming up, a couple of key dates. That is right. Um, we will publish a notice in the newspaper of uh, our public hearing to be set for August 14th. The publication will be in uh, our newspaper um, of local circulation, in our case it's the Daily Herald, and it will be published uh, on July 10th. It will state where the public hearing will be, what time, and between the period of the publication of the notice and our discussion, our adoption of the uh, budget, um, we will have discussions not only with the board, but also the board will be available for any public inspection, or uh, both on our website and at our district office. So I think the, the key items here that uh, July 10th it will be published, but uh, to some comments earlier in committee, the board really hasn't, th this will be the first time that we all see this, so for anybody seeing that for the first time, we're really seeing this this proposed budget for the first time gives us an opportunity to review it um, uh, prior to the August 14th public hearing and so people will you know people are welcome to come at six o'clock on August 14th to comment um, 
hear our, our conversation. Uh, I also believe there's going to be a special board meeting that we're trying to organize somewhere between those two dates right. so that we as a board can get into some details of that budget, make some, some recommendations and really, really come up with, um, you know, really understand what's in that prior to that uh, August 14th meeting. Uh, that date hasn't been set yet, but that will be posted on the website as usual per the requirements so many days ahead, you'll have a posting of that, that meeting. So people are welcome to join us on that meeting as well. We will have a facilities and finance committee meeting on the 24th of July as well. And there will be some budget, I'm sure, conversation at that meeting as well. So multiple opportunities for people to, to come talk to us about it and uh, encourage everyone to, to come out and see that. And uh, and talk to us about it. So, any other comments or anything? Um, so, uh, but this motion is to uh, accept this entire calendar, which also includes um, uh, filing with the Bay County Clerk's Office. In you know, we're proposing uh, September, so this is a full and it's posted on the website. So a full budget calendar here. So, uh, can we have a motion to accept the calendar? Please? So moved. Second. Any other any comments, questions? Okay. Roll we'll call. Batson. Aye. Rudy. Aye. Huber. Aye. Luce. Aye. Lundstedt. Aye. Thurman. Aye. Okay. Your motion uh, passes. Uh, the next item is a portion of that calendar. A resolution calling for a public hearing on the, the 2018 budget. Uh, that's the August 14th date, and that's the official public hearing, 6 o'clock. So we need a motion to approve that date. So moved. Seconded. Um, Any further comments? Will it be, are we flipping our meetings now permanently? Yes. So, so no, this it's at six o'clock. Oh, this is it's, not yeah. the facility this is plan. The, Sorry. Yeah, this Got is the it. public hearing Sorry. special yeah. meeting, of, Sorry, a I specific guess. public hearing for the budget. So. Okay. And that will take place after F and F then? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it'll be six o'clock and or yeah. at the conclusion of the facilities and finance yeah. committee meeting that night. So actually it would have to be exactly at six. It'll be okay. So we so may have to, to or we might go six to we might, yeah, you know, we that way you've got an hour for right now. now. So, so, but the time will be posted. Thank okay. You. Did we take a roll call on that? No. no okay. Well, right. we, we have the motion. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, Any other questions or anything? Comment? Okay. Roll call. Uh, Rudy? Aye. Huber? Aye. Luce? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Thurman? Aye. Batson? Aye. Uh, next item is the appointment of school treasurer, which we also have to do, and given the retirement of, uh, yes, well, here we need to uh, have a new treasurer. Yes. So moved. Second. Any, uh, any further questions or comments? Anything to add to that? Yeah. Well, I think you ought to add that the motion is for Dan Stanley to be oh, yes, here. Yeah, yeah. Let's right. name him. Thank yeah. you, Rick. Yeah. <laughs> Thank so you for the clarification. Who made the uh, motion? Yeah. We don't say that enough. Okay. Kevin. Did. Kevin. Okay. So, so, motion to approve Dan Stanley as the yes school treasurer. Okay. Any further? Thank you, Rick, for catching that. Okay. Roll call, please. Huber. Aye. Luce. Aye. Lundstedt. Aye. Thurman. Aye. Batson. Aye. Rudy. Aye. Okay. Congratulations, Dan. Congratulations. Yeah, another thing. You're in again. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, last but not least, a bid recommendation. This is for the LHS West Access Drive. Yes. As discussed earlier at our facilities and finance committee, we are requesting approval of a bid to a Lamp Concrete Contractors Incorporated in the amount of $139,751 for the West Access Drive renovation project. Okay. And this is basically relocating the existing drive west. I think you said 96 94, feet. 94, 94 feet, feet to the west of the, the west. existing drive on West Park. And allowing for additional turn lanes yes. in and out of the, uh, so it'll be a two, right. two lane, two direction road instead of just a one-way road yeah. at this point in time. Okay. May I have a motion, please? 
I move to accept a bid for the LHS plus access drive. Yeah, do you have the amount? Yes, 139.781. 751. Second. 1,751. Second. 751. Second. 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 Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Thurman? Aye. Batson? Aye. Rudy? Aye. Huber? Aye. And I have no other, anyone have anything else other for utilities and finance? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Nothing for property. Um, so if I can ask you to uh, make sure the minutes reflect that we did not vote on that one agenda item that has a star next to it. Okay, and all also for the executive okay. session, we will not vote on any action after the executive session. Okay, thank you. 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 Thank so with that in mind, uh, I'd ask for a motion to uh, convene an executive session. There are two topics, one employment of employees, 5 ILCS 120-2C1, and the second probable litigation, 5 ILCS 120-2C11. I move to go into an executive session. Second. Second. Any discussion? No. Roll call. Um, Lundstedt? Aye. Thurman? Aye. Batson? Aye. Rudy? Aye. Huber? Aye. Luce? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Uh, again, we will not be taking any action when we return from the